incluye el compromiso de la presencia plena de todos y la capacidad de comunicarnos en, en nuestros idiomas. So we work within a framework that's called language justice and language justice includes um, the right that we all have to participate in spaces um, as our full selves and in our languages. Y quisiéramos comenzar reconociendo todos los idiomas presentes hoy aquí, pero también los idiomas de los pueblos indígenas de las diferentes tierras en las que nos encontramos, que siguen en existencia y en resistencia en esas tierras. Uh, and we want to start by acknowledging and honoring all the languages here in this space, but most importantly, the languages of the indigenous people and of the uh, people from the original uh, lands that uh, a lot of those languages are still in existence and resistance wherever we are um, at today. Um, se usará ambos idiomas, inglés y español, y um, las personas que prefieren participar en un solo idioma um, elegirán un canal en la, en, en la función de interpretación de Zoom dentro de un ratito. Nada más para avisar, no ha sido activada la función todavía. So we're going to be using uh, Spanish and English um, actively in this space. Uh, the function has not been activated yet, but once it does, we're going to explain how it works and we will be using the Zoom interpreting tool for that. Cuando se active um, la función de interpretación, lo que van a ver es lo siguiente. Um, si se están uniendo a través su, de su computadora, van a ver un botón en forma de globito en la parte inferior de su pantalla. Dan clic ahí y podrán escoger entre el inglés y el español. So uh, once it is activated, this is what you're going to see. If you're joining us from a computer, you will see an icon in the shape of a globe that's going to appear at the bottom of your screen. And then you select your preferred language channel through there. Um, si se están uniendo a través de un teléfono inteligente, una tableta, verán um, un botón con tres puntitos que dice more or más de Dependiendo de, el, de su idioma, dan clic ahí, se abre otro menú, interpretación de idiomas, dan clic ahí, e igual podrán escoger entre el español y el inglés. So, if you are joining us via a tablet or a smartphone, the button for interpretation is going to look like three little dots. It might say más or more, then is a drop down menu that says language interpretation, and then you select a preferred language channel, English or Spanish, there. Y esto lo tienen que hacer una sola vez al eh, principio del evento y luego se pueden quedar eh, en este mismo canal eh, durante todo el evento. Eh, si se sienten cómodas en eh, los dos idiomas, no hay necesidad de escoger canal. And you can select that right at the beginning of when we start the event. And also, if you feel, feel comfortable in both languages, there is no need to select a channel. You can just stay in the main room. Y finalmente, cualquier problema eh, que encuentren con la interpretación, por favor, siéntanse libres de comunicarse o conmigo con Alexia, o sea, siempre la persona que nos esté interpretando a través del chat y les ayudamos con mucho gusto. And finally, if you have any issues with technology, please do not hesitate to contact me or Alexia or whoever is not interpreting at the time, and we will be very happy to help you out with that. Y esto es todo. Muchísimas gracias por tenernos y que tengan un lindo evento. Gracias. That is it from us. Thank you so much. We hope you, the, you have a wonderful uh, talk today. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Katya and Alexia. You should see the interpretation feature is live and you can select your language channel. Um, and with that, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we, I think, have given folks enough time to join us so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, please let us know where you're tuning in from in the chat. Uh, my name is Maricela and I am the Programming and Communications Coordinator here at Oxy Arts, and I'm tuning in from Oxy Arts here in Highland Park. Uh, tonight's event is part of the related programming for Carolina Caicedo Care Report, the exhibition currently up at Oxy Arts. Care Report is visible through our street facing windows along York Boulevard. So if you're local, we invite you to drop by in person. There are also activity guides for students of all ages available on site. Uh, and we have video documentation of the exhibition and the activity guide available online as well. You'll be receiving a follow-up email from Zoom tomorrow with the recording of this one and more information about the Care Report exhibition. Uh, if you don't already, I encourage you to follow us on Instagram at OxyArts to stay updated about upcoming events. 
Um, and before introducing tonight's moderator, I quickly want to acknowledge that Oxy Arts occupies the ancestral, ter traditional, and contemporary lands of the Tongva people. Uh, and with that, I'm excited to introduce Cindy Donis. Cindy is rooted in the history of the Guatemalan indigenous diaspora, her family's life as immigrants, and the everyday power and empathy she witnesses her community display in Maywood and Southeast LA. She graduated with a bachelor's in Chicano studies and gender and feminist studies from Pitzer and joined the East Yard Communities for Environmental Justice team in 2017. And I'll pass things off to Cindy. Thanks, Marisela. Hi, everybody. I hope you're doing well. Uh, I want to echo the land acknowledgement that Marisela shared earlier that we are zooming in from different places. But if you're in LA County, right, this is native Tongva territory and continues to be native Tongva territory. Um, I also want to send a message of solidarity with the API community who has been facing uh, an increased number of attacks since the beginning of the pandemic uh, and whose lives were lost in a tragic shooting in Georgia due to white supremacy, patriarchy and hate right against sex workers as well and just uh, my heart goes out to everyone that's been impacted by this fatality. Um, I also want to send a big virtual hug to each and every one of you that is tuning in. Each of us has been impacted in one way or another by this pandemic, and it's really important to acknowledge that, to name that in this moment. Uh, and that's also the reason, right, why we're meeting virtually through this Zoom platform. Um, uh, and a big shout out and thank you to Oxy Arts and Carolina Caicedo for inviting us to take part in this series. I invite everyone to check out the Care Report art exhibit um, or watch the video from the comfort of your home if visiting the location uh, isn't an option. Um, so like Marisela shared, my name is Cindy. My pronouns are she, hers. Uh, I am zooming in from, from Southgate, from Southeast LA. Uh, and I'm an organizer and member with East Yard Communities for Environmental Justice. We are a grassroots member-led and horizontal organization, organization fighting uh, environmental racism and building community here on Tongva territory in areas also known as Boyle Heights, uh, East LA, Southeast LA, uh, and Long Beach. And I see a couple of y'all members here on the in the attendees list. Definitely want to say hi and shout, give y'all a shout out for making it through. Um, we're approaching the, the end, right, of Women's Month, but the power of women, trans women, and our non-binary relatives doesn't end uh, at the end of March. Uh, it continues every single day. And I, to get, I get to be part of that magic with some pretty dope ass people uh, who are here with me today on this panel. Uh, Anna, Frenchie, Jan, and Marily are all East Yard members as well. We will be sharing on our experiences at the front line uh, and the importance of naming and uplifting the intersections of our identities in this fight against environmental racism. Uh, there will be time for a Q&A. So if folks have any questions, if, if so, something sparks a question or comment, please, please feel free to submit them in the little uh, question button that's there. Um, so I wanna pass it. To, to, to the other folks on this panel uh, to introduce yourselves, share your name, your pronouns, where you're from, um, and how, how did you find out about East Yard? Uh, what called you to join, to learn, and, and to take action here in your communities? Uh, and I'll pass the mic first to, to Anna. Hey y'all, hope you guys are having a wonderful afternoon on this beautiful cloudy Thursday where we're on Matt, it's cloudy. Uh, my name is Anna and my pronouns are she, hers. I'm from the Bell, so Southeast LA area. And I've been in Eastern for actually almost three years at this point, which is crazy to, to think because it doesn't even feel like it's been three years. Um, I found out about this organization through a friend. She was actually doing research while I was like complaining to her that I've never found like any organization that like does work like in this area or like in any other area that I know of but also my knowledge wasn't really great back then but um she told me about this this amazing amazing nonprofit, and she's like you should email them and just like see where see where it goes and then she showed me the website and it was called East Yard Communities for Environmental Justice and I was like okay okay I see and then I, I went down and it's right there southeast LA area and I was like okay like I gotta do this messaged um message and then um I got an email back from Laura, which is the or the now co-director um, of East Yard, which I'm very happy. And um, she was just like, why do you want to join if you go to UC Santa Barbara? 
<laughs> I was like, oh my God, like, why do I want to join? If I go all the way to, to UC Santa Barbara, privileged school, right? But um, I was like, you know what? Southeast LA area is my home. I plan to come back here and just really like be part of the change of my community. And ever since then, I've just been in and, you know, I have a longer story for that, but we'll save that for another time. So yeah, pass over the mic back to Cindy. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for sharing. Um, now let's hear from uh, Frenchie. How did you get involved? How did you hear about ECR? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Francisco, pronouns are she, hers. My nickname is Frenchie. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm 21 years old. I'm from Boyle Heights uh, here on the east side of Los Angeles. Um, I'm a senior here at Oxy. I'm majoring in urban and environmental policy. And it was through the um, Urban and Environmental Policy Institute that I was able to intern at East Yard, I think summer of 2019. Um, and I think from there, you know, it's been almost like two years now. And I spent two summers interning and I'm also a member since as Cindy explained, they work with the East Side as well. So um, yeah, I've been a member for almost two years now. And I would say that like I said, I found out about East Yard through my summer internship, but what really like made me stay in the organization and further participate as a member um, was just really like the community that's built there. Um, I realized like not only are they a group of amazing people, um, but I think one of my favorite things is that it feels like you know, so it's not formal. It's not really like too like formal business. Like, like you know, we're there with the cheese man. Uh, we're there, you know, talking about stuff that go beyond like what the organization like does. You know, we really care for each other um, and help each other out. So, I would say what really you know made me stay was one looking as an intern. You know, seeing all the work that happens to like you know make things work to like fight um, for justice in our communities. Um, so much work gets put into that. Um, and just seeing that the organizers and the rest of the staff are really, um, are also part of the communities that are affected by environmental injustice. So that was really powerful to see. And as a member, you know, there's really, it's really such, it's really a tight knit community. Um, and it's never like the executive director makes the decision because they're the executive director. It's really like, a consensus amongst everyone. And so, you know, if anyone has a question, um, you know, you could ask the question, we're willing to work through through things out. And I just thought it was, you know, a wonderful organization. And that's how I've been, you know, a member now for almost two years. Thank you, Frenchie. Yeah, and I think what, what both of your stories highlight, right, is like this horizontal model of like, whoever wants to come through, come through and you'll find your space and you'll find community with us and among us, correct? Um, and so thank you both for sharing. I'm gonna pass it now to Jan to also share their story, which might be a little a little different from what, uh, <laughs> what folks have shared. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Jan Victor and Dawson, gender pronouns they, them, and the Tagalog word Sha. I'm an immigrant from the Philippines, um, from uh, Iba, Zambales, and I now reside in so-called Carson, and I am also a member and staff um, with East Yard. And yes, to what Cindy said, um, there's an ongoing joke that I am an infiltrator. I'm a spy because I found out about ECR through Idealist. I literally took a break from organizing after being super burnt out from college organizing. And I was going through a lot of personal things. I actually, a month before I got my interview at ECR, I actually got a DUI. Um, and so when I had my interview, I remember telling them, I just got a DUI. I'm a good organizer, but I need to tell you this um, because I saw your job and I'm trying to go back to organizing and it's in my community. Oh, shoot, I want to organize there. And honestly, I really didn't think I was going to get an interview or even the job offered. And I distinctly remember Mark and Angelo. Um, Mark with his long beard, wearing shorts, and Angelo, super like just dressed up professional. And I was so confused about what this org was. So I was like, well, I'm already a weird person, so I'm sure it's going to be great. And next thing I know, uh, two weeks later, they asked me for like a second interview and it, they offered me the job. And I like to recognize that story because it 
I mean, there's a lot of even why I I still am in East Yard where um they took a chance on me. I really was not, you know, in that in a good place after I got my DUI and coming to East Yard was a space where I was able to reconnect to the community that I grew up here um, in so-called uh, Los Angeles, Tongva territory. And it was actually a place, you know, I've been on the team for seven years. It's actually been seven years and a month since I've been at East Yard, which is the same time I've been sober. Um, and it's been a place where I've been able to grow and heal a lot of the trauma that I had from the very toxic organizing I was exposed to. And that it's also been a space to reconnect with my, my hometown and the people um, that was part of my community and to actually start revisiting things in my childhood that I thought were normal and to start combating it. And I think for me, you know, as I think about how I've continued to stay on um, in this space is because ECR has been a space for me to question and to, to challenge and also to rename and to re-envision what my community looks like because I thought refineries and pollution was normal. When I came from the Philippines to the US, this was normal and ECR has given that space where me, I lived there for 14 years and didn't know how bad it was. And then it actually gave me a voice to be able to speak the truth that I wanted to see. And so while I may be some random person, they just found it on Idealist. I think, you know, I'm really blessed to have found this home in this, in this place, especially being queer, where we're always looking for family. And I, I found a family after I came back from college and after even my struggles with my, you know, um, with substances. And so I really want to lift that up that it's not just about organizing. It's, it's actually about creating a space that's home, that's, that feels safe. And that's what's been East Yard for me and why, I mean, seven years later, I don't see myself not being a member, even if I were to leave staff. Um, that's it, check. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. And like, you have had so many like accomplishments that I've been witness to and so much growth, I think that we all witness with each other as well. And to highlight things that you, some of the things that you shared, it's like, um, when in talking about environmental racism and the issues in our communities, it's everything embedded within that, right? It's also the policing, the harsh discipline, the violence that our communities endure and us fighting against that and creating the spaces where we're nurtured, where we're cared for, where we're addressing the trauma that we've experienced and envision and cre actively creating that world, right? Um, while also addressing all the BS pollution that we're dealing with, all these polluters that are doing that harm, right? And, and pushing for policy and regulation changes as well. Um, it's everything and all of that embedded within the same time. And that's also why this, we we're naming the intersectionality, right, of our experiences, because we're not these like single identities of, of people, right? Um, thank you so much for sharing. Um, wanted to pass the mic to our last panelist, Mari Lee, uh, to introduce herself and share her story. Um, so hi, my name's Mary Lee Gutierrez. And opponents are she, her, um, and I'm from Linwood. And I found out about East Yard. <laughs> I found out about East Yard um, my freshman year of high school when Cindy did a presentation about <laughs> when Cindy did a presentation about um, youth in action. And what called my attention to participate and take action was my recollect thoughts and feelings that I had, which mostly was how infuriating I felt because um, after that presentation, I learned that the people that I love and care for are vulnerable to um, health risk from the pollution that we in a daily basis have to go through. And I just, I don't know, I felt very like, like I could, like no matter what age I am, could always have like my voice, and this program like helped me find my voice, and hopefully in the future, um, um, generations before me don't have to worry about these problems because, you know, we stand strong, and I hopefully we end this problem strong. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, and I think your story reminds me a lot of my own story also. And I, as a youth organizer, I constantly see myself reflected in, in all of the membership and youth in particular on like, 
having so much angst right around what we're seeing but not knowing the full picture and to even a certain degree for myself even normalizing these things right which was Jan what you shared around like living here this is our everyday and we just think it's the normal oh, everybody has this right everybody has a refinery in their hood right everybody has a rail yard everyone has these freeways and and it's when we start inter interrupting those thoughts um, when we start getting more exposed and starting to have more conversations with each other as a community about um, our health and our wellness, then it's when we like make those connections. And um, I'm so glad you were in that class, Marily, and have joined. You're definitely a beautiful, beautiful source of inspiration and like passion and fire within the East Yard family. Um, now, thinking about like who you are and now that like as East Yard members, uh, but all of your other identities that you carry, how has it all shaped your understanding of the world? How has that shaped your beliefs? Um, how has that influenced the fire that you carry with you in terms of addressing the issues in our communities, right? And thinking about um, identity at large around gender, race, class, sexuality, and all the other things and ways that we identify ourselves, right? Um, how has that shaped your understanding? And this is open to any one of you to answer first. Um, I could go first. Um, so I would say, um, I think growing up as a woman of color um, in a tradition, in a, like a fairly traditional Mexican um, household, um, I think from a young age, I was told like, Calladita te ves mas bonita, which in English kind of translates to the quieter you are, the prettier you look. Um, and that usually applied to um, when dealing with any authority figure, whether that was at school, whether it was with the government, you know, police or anything like that. Um, and so I think, you know, for a while, I kind of, I kind of like, that's kind of what I did. But then after, you know, I started noticing that usually these people that are in positions of authority, don't necessarily help you out. And at times are the ones that are like, um, that kind of screw you over. Um, and so I realized that, you know, I got to speak up. And so basically, so now, you know, I kind of say what I got to say and I stand up for what I believe in because I mean, you know, that's what I do. Um, and I think um, specifically like my experiences at East Yard, the first time I interned there, I think Laura, who as Anna said is now the co-director. Um, she was like, oh, we're gonna go give public comment at AQMD, which is the air quality management district. And I was like, oh, um, okay, cool. <laughs> Cause I was like, all right, I'll do it. Um, and, I, and like, that was like the first time I was able to look at these people like in the face, these tall um, people that make the decisions about, you know, our air quality and like really tell them how I felt. And so I was like, you know, y'all are screwing us over. Like y'all are choosing like profit over people. And so what's up with that? Like y'all gotta do something about that. Um, and so I think, you know, that was the first time I kind of felt really empowered to do something. And I think um, now not only do I think it's important to keep industries in check, I also think it's important to keep the regulators in check because they don't do their jobs most of the time. Um, so yeah, so basically now, you know, I gotta, you know, I just say what I gotta say. Um, and I think the another part of my identity that kind of goes hand in hand with this is um, growing up in a working class family. Um, and so, you know, as I said, I'm from Boyle Heights and the impacts of environmental racism um, and environmental blackmail in our communities um, has really affected the livelihood of, you know, my family and like the community, everyone else around us. And so I think my mom has worked at the, like in the industry in the city of Vernon, which is practically all industrial. So she has worked there for almost like my whole life. And I realized that many times these industries come and are like, well, if you want jobs, like we'll give you the jobs, but it's at the expense of our health and well-being. And so that's when I also realized that that's not okay. And there's definitely like, you know, we have to do something about that because our health should not be put at risk for profit or for our own survival because we shouldn't be put in that position in the first place. And like Cindy was saying, like, it's not normal to see the refineries in our communities, to see the freeways, all these industries, like they're put in our community, like for a reason and it's environmental racism. 
Um, and so, you know, we got to do something about that, which I think now has really like made me like be more involved in, in East Yard and like continue and like, well, now I'm majoring in urban and environmental policy, which I hope, you know, helps me um, continue the fight against, I guess, all these systems of oppression. Thanks for sharing, Frenchie. Um, yeah, I think when you said, uh, when you started talking about like your family being working class, um, I just, I literally, um, I was just reflecting particularly. So, so I have a YouTube channel. Whenever I introduce myself, I say, hi everyone. My name is Jen Victor. My gender pronouns are they, them, and the Tagalog word sha, and I'm a queer, non-binary immigrant Filipino organizing in my pocket of so-called Los Angeles Tongva territory. And I literally realize every single part of my identity, you know, shapes a lot of my experience. And when you're talking about that working class experience, I think something that just came, started bubbling up in me was thinking about my identity as a Filipino immigrant and um, that my mom, so when I was a kid, my, I was born in August and two months later, my mom actually had to leave me to go to the US to provide for my family. And I didn't really see her. I, I, I apparently only saw her once and I just discovered it recently in pictures since she, I thought she left me for seven years, but she visited one time and I, there's a picture I can prove, but that so many Filipinos for me, you know, like many of our families are separated because our countries have been extracted and our people, the only way to provide opportunities for their families um, is to actually lead their families and support them by living abroad, taking care of other families and other people. And, and so, you know, my Filipino identity has shaped a lot of my experience and also being an immigrant because most of us have lived either with one parent missing or both parents missing. And that's all in the pursuit of trying to provide, right? Uh, and that's a byproduct of imperialism and colonialism. Like our people leave our country because there aren't opportunities there. Or, and the, I wanna lift up the biggest export of the Philippines is actually its people and its biggest import is remittances or remittances from our people working abroad. And so my Filipino identity has shaped how I've traversed this world, especially living in on, on Tongva territories, because I know I'm not in my homeland. I, I, I haven't visited my homeland in 24 years. And at the same time, like I want to organize, right, and live responsibly here. And I think all these different identities, when I name it, it's because I know it governs a lot of the values I have and how I try to walk on this, you know, on this planet. And that being here in on Tongva territories, like I've also had the opportunity to grow in ways that I don't know I would have been able to grow um, in the homeland. And, and like one of the things that comes up for me being Filipino is also being queer and non-binary. And that identity isn't something that I realized when I was two months old, even when I was seven, when I first came to the US, a lot of my identities have been around a lot of processing and reflecting. Fun fact, I didn't know I was Filipino until I left the Philippines. I didn't, I didn't know. I thought I was Filipino and that there was white people in our country. And then I got here and I realized I was Filipino and there were other types of people and it was more complex. And then when I think about my queer identity, the, that one, that was a long process of really coming to who I am, right? Coming to terms with the person that I always was, but it's also, it's also been a learning process since I actually didn't identify as queer and non-binary until the space that East Yard gave me. Um, it actually allowed, you know, in this space, in this community, I've been able to be, to meet mentors and learn from people and actually start to question parts of my identity and and find answers that I already had, but it was just at the surface, just waiting to be fully named. And and so a lot of my identities have always been centered around processing and and coming to terms with. And the the thing that comes up to me is like that this space has been a space to be as authentic. Like my identities are something that I was told by the world they're not normal or it's other or it's foreign, and that it's not that isn't the case and that I need to learn to love myself, embrace it and let people know. But that unfortunately, like many of us, right? Being women, being non-binary, queer and femme, um, we're constantly told to be quiet, to stop being so extra and just conform when it's like, no, let's celebrate every facet of it. And I want you to know, I want you to know who I am and you're not gonna forget it. And, and so I think for me, that's how all of my identities have played this huge 
huge part because I've been told to like hide it. And then I realized like, no, man, we're freaking fabulous, beautiful, amazing, and resilient. And so there's no turning back at this point because I can't go back that way. <laughs> so yeah, I definitely want to um, just appreciate being in this space, especially being non-binary and femme, because um, there's a lot of, you know, women spaces and oftentimes they forget about trans non-binary bodies that we're all building community and fighting for the same liberation from the same systems that oppress us. I love what you said, Jen, and also Frenchie, and definitely, you know, I also grew up in a Hispanic household and also was mentioned what Frenchie said, like, the quieter you are, the prettier you look. Um, definitely, and I feel like I did not find my voice at all until, like, after I joined this space, to be honest, because, um, fun fact, after I joined East Year, two days later, I gave my first public comment for Semex, and that was something that was like very like <laughs> traumatizing, not traumatizing, but it pushed me very much to out of my comfort zone that I never thought I had um, because I just felt like I was too sheltered. I felt like I was like, sorry if you guys hear scratching, my dog's like being weird right now, but um, he's like scratching into the carpet, like if he's gonna go anywhere. But anyways, let's ignore him. Uh, but just, you know, Honestly, I just, I just felt like I was very sheltered, very reserved, not knowing like if I should speak up about what, if, if I should ever like speak up at all about issues that I cared about or even speak up like about even how I was feeling or expressing myself because you know, we, how Jen was saying, like we come off at, as extra, we're oversensitive, we're, we're like just not, to, we're supposed to stay quiet and just like go with the flow. And I was like taught like to just go to work provide for for my husband or something and like you know that that's just not how I, how I am like after coming to the space and realizing how like there's women like Cindy like Laura that like just like nah I'm not gonna do that like I'm not gonna stay at home and just cook for my husband like I'm gonna be I'm gonna be here with the movement I'll be here like raising up my voices and that's like what motivated me like I remember like Cindy coming to my house for the very first time talking about how I was going to say my public comment to um, the Bell City Council about CEMEX and honestly um, it was overwhelming for me because you know I had just joined Easter and I went to court Easter, so that was like all, all of a thing in, in itself right and I was like over here like trying to figure out like what was going on what were the lawyer saying what was the judge saying it was like a whole complex thing like for my little brain at the time but honestly um and just like how Cindy was explaining to me, like, this is why things are bad and I can't say it because I'm not from here. Like, you need to say it because you're from here. It's your community and it's going to affect, like, a lot of us. So when she's put it in that perspective, I was like, I'm literally the one that could, like, either make or break this. And, you know, like, I spoke up for the very first time. I stuttered. I was nervous. I was shaking. But you know what? It's like that voice that I really needed to have. And ever since then, I just every time they're like, we're going to do public comment. I'm like, hell yeah, like I'm on that. Like, <laughs> I'll be on calls until four in the morning to be on public comment now that we're like, via, now that we're all like during COVID hours, you know, but like, it's definitely like gave me a voice and it's definitely given me something to speak about and to really like, just speak about issues that I that I know I could probably change because I really want to be that impact on my community. And it doesn't matter who you are, what you, what you identify as, as long as you have, per, as long as you want to be a person, uh, how do I see it? Like, as long as like you believe in something that you want to be the change, like go for it and don't let anyone stop you. Yeah. Um, it's well said. And, you know, I stand by whatever, I stand by um, from the comments that you guys all said, because I personally could relate. Um, so regarding the experiences my family and I went through, it expanded my viewing of how unfair and I guess troubled social status can become, especially coming down to priorities and assisting communities like, like ours. And because there's like a hierarchy and that hierarchy is due to race dominance. And the, this part inferior to me, this is like the core. It's like, I see the world as all human beings. And, you know, we are as, you know, human beings, we all have the same needs. So why, why 
can't all humans have access to what we all need but and and it's because of power and money and it upsets me and it shapes my my understanding of the world and believes that you know we need to put a stop to whatever the system is because the system should be balanced and it should be something that shouldn't have a question shouldn't be questioned shouldn't be like oh well you know it, sh it should be like like i don't know like uh sorry <laughs> like already existing but you know it's okay i guess for the, if i haven't known about this um i would have have been open-minded about things but now that you know i'm still learning from the meetings that we have um hopefully i could uh, hopefully um towards the future we could uh, have changed to this so-called system. Yeah, I think, Marily, what you're saying is also like, we're all still always constantly learning, right? And that's the space with Easter. That's each membership space for folks uh, who aren't familiar with our structure. We have um, membership space and membership meetings in different regions across LA um, or so-called LA. And that's what we're trying to build within those spaces is like community. It is understanding each other, right? It is uh, seeing each other for our most authentic selves like Jan shared right and and having a space to be our most authentic selves um, and learn together to to really understand this break it down and then a lot of times honestly it doesn't make sense it, the way that these government systems function uh, like Frenchie said right it doesn't make sense because they're not even doing their job most of the time uh, and it's us then creating and shaping the world that we want to envision um, which takes me then to the next question. And thank you all for sharing so much. You're getting a lot of love on the on the chat if you haven't been able to check it out. Um, with ECRD, we do so much. Like, y'all, we do so much. We have direct campaigns against polluters, working on policy and regulations to increase protections at a larger, more local level in our communities, and also actively building the spaces that we want to see at the same time, right? Like, for example, our Cosecha Colectiva, which is our decentralized garden that addresses the food apartheid in our hoods. Um, each and every single one of you take part um, in, in one of these efforts or multiple efforts, right, that we're working on. And I wanted to make space for folks to, to learn about what are some of the things that we are working on as ECRD. Um, and, and yeah, pass the mic over to you all to share on uh, one or multiple issues that you want to highlight. So much. I literally was like, I'll, I'll go first while folks think, since there's so many things that we're involved in. And also, I my friend just told me that my Roger um, emoji or <laughs> icon is on my Zoom. I didn't know that. Oops, my bad. I didn't realize it would show on the, <laughs> the webinar, but I hope you're enjoying that, American Dad fans. Um, yeah, there's so many different things in ECR that... Uh, I do both as a staff, but then also as a member. And I think one of the things that I've been really appreciative of that we work on because it's an issue that's affected me my whole life in um in on on the in the in these um in Long Beach and Carson uh, are the refineries. When I first came on, folks that I was organizing had talked about the refineries, but ECR in its inception focused primarily on goods movement and freight. And so many of the members that were, were engaging in the Long Beach area live right next to some of the some pretty big refineries. Now one of the refineries is set to become the largest refiner in the West Coast. That's Marathon. And so one of the things in the my tenure at East Yard has been actually to help build out our members' capacity in understanding what refineries do, what they're actually processing, how it affects our health, because we know, okay, they pollute our air, it's bad, and it causes these health issues. But what are those health issues? And then what can we do within, you know, what can we do to transform it? What agencies regulate these bodies? As, uh, as some of the speakers have shared, right? Are they even regulating? Because apparently, it's not just the polluters, you have to 
uh, you have to push back at the regulators to do their job. And so one of the things that we've been able to build out in my time at ECR is our understanding of basically fossil fuel and energy extraction and how we combat um, the continued expansion because fossil fuel wants to expand. And I think that's something for me, like, I really just thought refineries were normal. It was the first thing I saw when I pulled up to the exit of the 405, exiting um, on Alameda Street in Long Beach. And I could see the refinery and the rail yard. And I legitly thought that was normal. And now I'm like, this is abnormal. Why is there an American flag on a refinery? Is, is oil so American? So is pollution American. Um, and so it's one of the things that we're still working on, we're still fighting. And what's been amazing is we've been able to connect with folks all over Turtle Island, that's so-called United States and uh, in North America and Canada, so-called Canada to have these fights because the same polluters we're dealing with are actually the same polluters trying to build out new industries in other regions um, in North America. And what we realize is we're not alone in this fight and that we all have to take stands in our own region because if we don't, they're gonna continue, they're gonna try to pit us against each other. They're gonna try to move a project once we win to another community that might not be engaged. And so um, that's one of the, our big fights right now in the ECR community, particularly in the Carson Long Beach uh, member is uh, refineries and energy extraction. Thank you for sharing. And to add to that, you're also connecting this, you're, you're working in a larger coalition with other folks who are also tackling refineries all across the U.S. and outside of the U.S. also, right? Because this is a, a huge global issue. And in thinking about our work locally here, the, the changes that we're supposed to, we're making and the, the learning and changes that we're making here also has those ripple effects, right? And stand in solidarity with others who are impacted as well by refineries worldwide. Um, I just wanted to name that because you're, you're doing a lot of work around this, Jan, and it's, it's with a lot of people also collectively with others. Um, but yeah, I want to welcome either Frenchie, Anna, or Marily, whoever wants to share on other stuff that we're doing as ECR. Um, I could go, and I apologize. There's a helicopter around the block, so <laughs> I apologize if y'all could hear that. But um, I would say one of the most recent um, issues, it was Gus's recycling. So it's a recycling center um, in our neighborhood um, that has been, you know, in general, like recycling some illegal things as well. So you know, not really even doing what they were supposed to do. And of course that um, adds to the already existing pollution in our communities, especially, you know, it's right next to um, the Ramona Gardens projects. Um, so, you know, it's just further exacerbating the disproportionate health risk um, and pollution that our communities face. Um, and so, you know, that has been an issue which was brought up by one of our fellow members, um, which like I said, you know, um, it's something like great about East Yard is that it's not just things that the executive director or that staff bring up. It's like the members can be like, oh, this is happening in my community. Can we do something about that? Um, and so, you know, work was being was being done to address this, such as, you know, kept an eye on them, um, seeing what they were doing, gathered some proof. And then recently um, at the, I think it was a board of supervisors meeting, uh, there was a victory, we had a victory. So like they were trying to get a um, conditional use permit, which would basically allow them to do the illegal stuff that they were doing basically legally. And so, but thankfully um, we ended up winning. And so they're not, they didn't get their permit. Um, but now, as we know, we have to make sure that they're being regulated because even though it's illegal, I mean, they were still doing it before. So we have to make sure that they don't continue to do it. And so once again, that comes with, you know, keeping not only Gus's recycling in check, but these people that are supposed to be regulating them in check as well. And I would say the other thing that has been a constant issue throughout East LA and Southeast LA has been the Exide cleanup. And so the Exide battery recycling plant was, um, <laughs> was recycling car batteries 24 seven um, for decades without adequate regulation, which heavily contributed to environmental and public health um, impacts in the surrounding communities. And so one of the biggest impact this had was that, um, <laughs> was that um, it contaminated the soil around with lead and arsenic. And so yes, Exide got shut down, but 
the cleanup has been a struggle because no one really wants to deal with that issue. And so, um, yeah, so then it's like keeping them in check as well, like um, toxic substance control, um, the government themselves, like ensuring like, yes, y'all clean that up because it's your fault for not making sure that these people were um, contaminating our soil, like y'all gotta do something about it as well. Um, and so that has been a constant battle, um, you know, that still work is still being done to address the cleanup to ensure that the cleanup is done properly because it's not, you know, it's not as simple as you think to clean up soil and you have to do it the right way. Um, and so, yeah, those are, I would say those are two issues that we're working on on the east side. Yeah, and to name like both of those have, those are both, both of those facilities, right? We're recycling. And that's a word that's used as like, like this green movement, like for climate justice and climate, uh, like climate change, right? We need to recycle, we need to recycle. But when you really look at these facilities, and what they're doing, they're causing a lot of harm in the places they're located. And they're located mainly in low income neighborhoods of color. And here are two examples, prime examples of that, right? With Exide, the car batteries that they were recycling and then Gus's recycler, which was doing a lot more than what they were even permitted to do in terms of um, what they were recycling, but in terms also um, creating more contamination um, so thank you for sharing that Frenchie and those are definitely two that yeah we're going to keep watchdogging it doesn't end with the the vote on the board it doesn't end with Exide getting shut down it's a continued process of us needing to protect and defend our hoods and our communities um, I want to pass it either to Marily or Anna to share on your respective neighborhoods and what you want to uplift uh, okay go uh, so I guess what problem that sticks with me is the water. Um, I guess to put it in terms how I think of it is when you think of water, you don't think of it of it being unhealthy. But I, I realized that, you know, through this program, that water could be acidic, especially in underprivileged communities like ours. And I guess it also made me also think that, you know, we shower, we in order to shower, we use water. We drink water in order to maintain our house. We brush our teeth, you know, we wash our dishes, the dishes that we eat food, you know, on. And it's like a problem that no matter like how you think of it, it comes bearing in in our daily, um, in our, you know, daily routines. So I think this has, you know, personally impacted myself because I guess now I don't, feel less comfortable drinking water like you know I feel like this is important to shed light upon on so. yeah thank you for highlighting water particularly there's folks in the team shout out to, to Janet who's doing work around water runoff um, and the impacts right we're, we're surrounded by industry and so that lack of trust of the water quality in our homes is because we're inhaling these things in our air, right? When it comes to the pollutants, how is it related and connecting and getting into our water system, right? Um, those are huge concerns for our community and more that we're, we're trying to develop. Um, there is a report that we have called H2Rs. Uh, shout out to Angela also and Flori who helped make that a reality um, that folks can find on our website as well to see and learn more around the work that we're doing in regards to water. Um, and Anna, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> it's so hard because it's like, damn, we, like Easter does a lot of work and it's just like you can't like put them into like two minutes because it just like goes on and on but I guess like projects that I've been a part on to shine like a little bit of light into the situation is that uh, the Sleepy Lagoon project um, I was actually doing outreach for the Sleepy Lagoon project so people could come and see um, what kind of location do they want this um, monument to be in and that to me like just seeing how everyone came like this was pre-COVID right <laughs> this is like months before COVID actually happened um, and just like seeing like how much outreach that we've done and you know going around knocking to people's houses and even though it was very awkward it was very weird sometimes people were like uh -uh, like I'm not about this you know it, it, it like it discourages you a little bit but and we got like so many people that were interested and were like yes we're down where is it and just to see how people were like I wanted to be in this location I want to see this I want like to to really like beautify a space and you know um yeah, so that, that's something that I've 
like I'm so glad that I was a part of, especially for the first like um for the first part. Um so yeah, that's something that I could shine light to. The sad part is Semex is still around, unfortunately. So they create like they create ready go ready gravel and stuff like that and ready mix and stuff and it's like their building is like an open space building you can see all of these like trains lined up with like gravel on top of them and stuff and they're not uh, it's that whole that whole thing like made was like the anger that brought up in me right a lot <laughs> and um but maybe want to stick around with these shirts because it's like something that you know i get i get to do something about it and i got to do something about it in the beginning but yeah, that's those are two main ones that come to my mind right now. Um, definitely a lot of other ones, but at the top of my head, these are the two that really just like are here. <laughs> yeah, and I see Glenn Dake on the chat who helped us formulate the Sleepy Lagoon project. And so uh, for a little bit more context, um, Sleepy Lagoon was a body of water that no longer exists um, in what is now technically the city of Bell. Um, and that was a, a place of, of convening of community uh, thinking in terms of when beaches were segregated um, and the continued white supremacy ideals, right? In terms of against um, uh, Mexican American folks, if we date back, right? That was a lagoon and body of water for native folks as well, Tongva folks. And so we were able to convene and gather community members, right? And Anna, you shared it sometimes in community work, something that we, we develop tough skin because rejection is definitely there. That's always gonna happen, but we'll find those folks that are super down and interested and invested in learning about this. Um, and then those other folks that were like, not right now, eventually, you know, they get curious, they wanna get down with the cheese man, they'll come through. Um, and so uh, with Sleepy Lagoon, yeah, we were able to convene different folks for a beautiful vision of um, revamping a green space, particularly in the city of Maywood. And so we're hoping that those are conversations that we're still gonna continue on and Semex and those two are very tied together because of the location. Um, and so thank you for, for uplifting and highlighting that as well and so if folks want to learn more again I invite you to, to check out our website to follow us on social media because that's where we keep updates and sharing um, uh, and we also have a, um, a newsletter that we share electronically through email with all those updates currently on a monthly basis. Um, now, uh, one of my, the second to last question that I have for y'all, and I invite folks, if you have questions already for any of the panelists, please, please feel free to put it in the little, like there's a Q and A button on the Zoom and you can submit them there um, if you already have questions. Um, but how has uh, the pandemic impacted your livelihoods? How has it impacted the, the work that we're doing and thinking about like, uh, East LA uh, and Southeast LA, many of our cities were epicenters um, throughout this year, this last year for COVID-19. We've seen inadequacy in terms of the rollout of the vaccine for communities of color, uh, for our elders of color, um, but this has had different types of impacts, right? So I wanted to acknowledge that again within this panel and, and uh, make the space to share on that. Um, I would say, I think personally, I think one of the biggest impacts this pandemic has had um, is kind of mainly around mental health. Um, I think being, a, being on Zoom for the past year has been um, kind of draining at this point. It's pretty draining um, to be on Zoom so much because, you know, I'm on Zoom for classes as well. And then, you know, constantly using the computer um, as well. And so I think that in conjunction with senioritis, like I said, I'm a senior. And so I already know the motivation is leaving me a little bit. Um, but I think, yeah, I think in general, just um, ensuring that, you know, I feel, I feel fine enough to like go to class and to like really like, you know, cause it's one thing to be in class. And then another thing is to be engaged in class. And so, um, doing that has been kind of tough, I guess, through the pandemic. And I think also like, even though I'm not too much of a social person, I do miss um, like social interactions, like with my friends and my peers, uh, you know, members at East Yard, we had great in-person member meetings with food and everything. So those are great. Um, 
And so I, I think like there's that anxiety because of the pandemic, like, yes, yeah, like sometimes I may see my friends, um, but there's still like that loop, like the pandemic is still happening. So you have, still have to be very careful about like how you like move around and navigate, um, you know, this, this pandemic essentially. And so I live with my parents as well. And so, you know, I worry about their health and well being too. So it's, I don't only like look out for myself, I have to look out for my parents um, as well. And so, you know, just being at home, you know, I have to go out more um, and get sunlight at least, you know, get some of that vitamin D. And so, you know, I have to do all that and while maintaining, you know, dealing with like anxiety and at times like depression that comes with being inside so much. Um, and just, you know, lack of connecting with people. Um, but I think overall that has impacted, um, I guess the work that, the work that I've been doing, just because like I said, it's been kind of draining to engage um, through Zoom, through the, through like the computer, I guess. Um, and so even though I, it has, um, I don't know, I guess I'm kind of used to it, like the messaging, like, um, through like Instagram or through like text and all that. And like the Zoom calls have been a little easier to do now, like a lot more of the hang of it now. It's still, you know, like gets a little tiring. Um, you know, it has uh, physical and like emotional impacts on you. You know, your eyes get a little more tired, like your back's a little more tired and all that. But I think, um, I guess I would say like one good thing is that somehow like, I've still been able to attend meetings and like East Yard has been very like, you know, if you have to do work and just kind of listen onto the meetings, like that's perfectly fine. And so that has been like easier to do through Zoom um, specifically. So like, you know, I could be doing some of my schoolwork, but still like listening in on the meetings. And so I haven't necessarily like completely disengaged from the work that's happening. Um, like I still know what's going on, but it's just um, like my own personal motivation to continue to um, do stuff and like truly like do some more work. Um, and like I said, it's also my last year. So I have to do my senior thesis as well. So that's been also a little uh, time consuming to do. Um, but so I would say that although like I haven't like really like disengaged or I haven't um, you know done too much, like I still feel connected with um, East Yard. And I still feel like um, connected with the work that they're doing, that we're doing, um, and still, you know, still, still fighting. Like, you know, people are calling in, like, now, yes, we don't do public comment in person, but, you know, people are still calling in and, like, going on Zoom and, like, make sure that, making sure that, you know, we keep these people in check. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's going okay, I guess now it's, it's going, um, okay, you know, we're managing. So, yeah. Yeah, um, thanks, Frenchie, for what you shared. I think talking about mental health and um, thinking about this pandemic and even more recently, just the one thing I can I can say from my experience, both as an organizer and as somebody living through a pandemic, um, is it just shows that our current society, it's not working. This doesn't work. Um, community has had to show up and support people with finances, people dealing with um, evictions, people not having access to food, like, you know, when I left up Whitney, um, Cindy shared um, that we have a, a La Cosa Hecha Colectiva, the collective harvest, where we've had to feed our members have fed other members because people can't afford produce because people aren't working. And that this pandemic just shows that all the, all the big problems that we have not tackled as an entire, North American community, whatever whatever you want to call us, right? This whole body of people living in this particular part of the globe. And that I think for me, one of the things I want to lift up I, with this pandemic just has been, um, yeah, I think just the, the way uh, that we've, the way that we, uh, I mean, I'm just going to say, frankly, it's like that racism and inequity is is pervasive in our community and that it is a problem that if we don't address, like look at who is dying from COVID, look at who's being hurt as a result of this pandemic and misinformation. And I, I'm saying that thinking about, you know, just this past week, right? Like, uh, and, and not, not even this past week, since the COVID pandemic and the, the 
the misleading titles, naming it, you know, na- naming COVID a specific community spread the virus allegedly, like it's created increased violence that we were already experiencing. Like Asian American Pacific Islanders already experienced violence even before the pandemic. And this pandemic has exacerbated it. And I want to name that because this didn't actually happen just a week ago. This has been happening and many of us have been watching it and, you know, organizing in the back, but it, it took this, this, this tragedy, this ma- massive tragedy that for people to turn an eye that like our community has been under attack. And I want to lift up that it's, it's not, you know, just AAPIs that are suffering and hurting. It's, it's all black indigenous people of color communities because this, this white supremacist colonial capitalist system was never meant to serve us. It was never meant to allow us to succeed. It was meant to degrade us. It was meant to take away our identities and tell us that it's not worthy and it's not meant to be part of this world and it can't succeed. And so us being resilient and fighting for our self-determination is in contrast to that kind of world that colonization and imperialism tried to rot all over this blue marble. And that's why we keep we're resilient. That's why we support each other because we know governments with even with black and brown representatives and indigenous representatives still serves a white supremacist agenda. And so our community, we say this every meeting at our Long Beach meeting, our community is at the forefront of change. And that's what the pandemic taught us that we know governments won't save us. They're gonna give us a fourteen hundred dollar check for how many months? And our community is gonna figure out: Can we get you food? Is it emotional or mental, you know, support? And and I think that's what's that's what's come up for me in this pandemic, where it's like we're trying to meet people with what resources we have, and we come together. Like some folks might have something to offer, and another might have something else, and we share it. And sometimes the what we have to offer isn't physical things; it's our presence, it's the space to process. Um, I also want to lift up, like not just thinking about the API attacks, but one of the things we did this past year at East Yard was really deconstructing and understanding you know, Black Lives Matter and the anti-Blackness that's pervasive in our society. And we processed that together and had even our elders that had their own trauma that they were trying to work through start to ask those questions. And that's what community does. We're trying to find a place where every single one of us is celebrated and that we're beautiful and that we can be part of this space as authentically as we can. And that we don't have to fear violence, that we can create safe communities when we come together. Um, And even with these attacks, you know, for me, I'm hopeful even at this pandemic, because I have a community like East Yard, I have my queer family, I have the people that have chosen to be my family, even though they're not my blood, because we, we, we have shared common understanding of the kind of world we want to build. Um, and so I just want to lift up that even with all these challenges that's come up in the pandemic, it's also been a painful but beautiful experience and a reminder that it's community and oftentimes it's Black, Indigenous, people of color, queer, trans, non-binary, women-led spaces and and groups that are the ones that create those supports and systems. All the fire emojis for you, Jan. Oh, yes, go for it, Anna. I I was just going to say I don't want to cry, but but Jan literally almost had me in tears. (laughs) Yeah, I just feel like East Yard has definitely created that space of, like, you know what, even like with everything that was going on, like with Black Lives Matter, with everything that's going on right now, even, and, you know, even through the elections, right? We were all anxious. We all had so much anxiety and we created that space to just vent. And that's what I really appreciate about Easter, that no matter what, like they're always here to be here for you and to make sure that you um, are, I guess, supported and also that, you're heard and no matter like nothing's off the table like everything you say matters and it's like oh just because you live a certain way like your your experience your your opinion's not valid like that's never the case here and I feel like they've definitely provided that space for us and exactly what Jen was saying like oh you know like because like look at the numbers of COVID like people are color like everyone's like being infected like so bad in in our communities right especially with we ha- already had lack resources already pre-COVID and now going into COVID times we have even more lack of resources and that's what I appreciate about Easter because um you know people are hitting me up every day or every other day like do you need anything how like how have you been able to manage this like like it, 
like do you, like do you need support in anything do you need food do you need this do you need that and I just appreciate that so much because I feel like that there's like a space that I couldn't get this anywhere else um and especially with like the monthly meetings as Frenchie was saying like I'm thankful that we're still able to continue these via Zoom do I wish we were still in person yes do I miss Rosarva Sur yes I do very much um and you know, like, it's just like, I really miss the interactions that we've had, like in person, I miss hugging people, I miss um, just catching up with people like in person and being able to like, share a space with them and feel more, more intimate, like more, more cared for. But you know, like, at, at the time being, I feel like um, Easter and everyone else is doing the best that they can to make sure that we're still engaged with each other, and engage with each other to make sure that we're still feeling supported, that we're still feeling like, um, no matter what happens in this pandemic, they're still going to push through and they're still going to support, um, support and they're still going to, as, man, as, Jan, as Jan mentioned, like be, um, be resilient and no matter what, they're always going to show up. We're always going to fight no matter what, like, and we're always going to stick up for, for everyone. And it's just been something powerful and something that's always been in my heart because I, that's something I definitely admire even with this whole pandemic, um, people are still showing up. People are still in the front lines of important issues that you know, unfortunately, government and higher ups don't don't get yet and don't understand. So, yeah. uh, so I strongly agree with all the comments made today. I, at heart, felt all of them, and um, and I could say that East Yard has made an attentive atmosphere that I never felt before, um, mostly because it challenged my mind for the most part. Like I never felt like, like I, I never had the thoughts that I have right now, which is like, or like the care that I have, like, you know, um, growing up, I just felt like it was just me and my family here. But, you know, now with Easter, I feel like we're all like, you know, family, because we're all like a community. And I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Um, but personally, regarding with the pandemic, I could see, I could see that it took a toll on me, especially with all the isolation, because um, during school, I I guess despite the class, I always looked forward to talking to my friends, doing homework with my friends, making plans for the weekends. But I guess now I can see like a disconnection with that, like being having to be on the phone. I mean, like you know on electronics technology for like 68 hours a day um like I can't you know if they text me I, I don't have energy to pick it up because I just want to lay on my bed and take my eyes off the screen and well it doesn't help that the fact that I'm trying to escape these emotions to playing video games so it extends more than eight hours probably like 12 hours and it's, I know it's very bad but it's literally now the only source of happiness that I have which is sad but yeah um so and I guess overall it affected our um outreach because we you know we're not together we don't have the same type of environment we would have if you know we're all sitting at a table and just talking about our day and I don't know it's just not the same but you know we'll get there soon and I'm looking forward to it there's no shame in how you cope, Marily. You keep playing if that's what's gonna help you, you know? Um, and yes, echoing every, like ditto to everything you all shared um, to like the impacts this has had, right? On our community's mental health, um, the power of mutual aid and support, right? Like. I also don't think ECR can claim everything. Like there's also just a bunch of other community members who have really stepped up um, outside of ECR that, in, in our in Southeast LA and Long Beach and East LA who have um, filled those gaps um, that are very intentional in our communities, right? Those inequality gaps in terms of resources and just um, that has been super inspiring to see, right? Um, and also the, the Zoom burnout is so real. Uh, I definitely want to want to uplift what Frenchie, what you shared, right? And, um, and then to Jan, what you shared, like, I remember folks wanting, saying, right, like, when is it going to go back to normal? 
and this idea of like normal was good or pre-COVID was good, but that that's not the case, right? And so hopefully we never go back to normal and we're learning uh, from each other in this around what we're fully capable of doing. Like all the, the stuff we've been doing in terms of providing the mutual aid support, still being able to find connection, right? While physically distancing ourselves uh, for safety, but we've all, I think this has allowed us also to to find new ways to to build that connection to build community outside of our local efforts here right and so thank you all for sharing um I, I want to make space if folks have any questions that are in the in the attendees list right if y'all have any questions again um please please let us know but you can put them on the the Q&A button, but if you're like, oh, I don't know where the Q&A button's at, and it's just easier to put it in the chat, I also welcome that um, to put it on the chat. Um, and as a way, a, a last question that I have for you all is, uh, or, or an ask is, I want to invite you all to, to name and, and share a, around a woman, a trans woman, or a non-binary relative who has made an impact in your life, right? Acknowledging that um, we are our baddies right now, but we have definitely been inspired, moved uh, by others in our communities, right, that feel that fire in us. There are those that have come before us, our ancestors um, and movement ancestors, right, doesn't have to be a blood ancestor, uh, that, that fuel us and give us the fire. And so I want to pass it on to you all to also share and name someone. Um, I'll, and I'll share a link on one of the non-binary um, POC uh, artists. Um, oh, that Google link is so long that I wanted to just lift up is um, Alok uh, by Menon. Um, I've been following them for a long time and I just really appreciate a lot of their journey, um, especially because I think part of our journeys in our identities is like also learning like when we've been wrong. Um, uh, and one of the things, and I'm naming that because I uh, came from a very religious and conservative background um, before I got into deep grassroots organizing. My organize with where I learned to organize was through the church, and I don't. I recognize that. Like I want to acknowledge that. Like I actually learned how to door knock because I door knocked for her um, for vacation Bible school. But I want to lift up a lot just because they talk about that experience of growing up in, you know, in, in this setting in Texas and um, and they're coming to terms with their own non-binary identity. And even when they didn't start from conservative to non-binary, it was like LGBT queer. And then there was also some internalized transphobia that we have. Like even when I was, you know, coming to terms of being queer and gay, like, I had my own innate transphobia that I've learned to like work through. And I'm like, no, that's not okay. And like, that's actually, I, like I'm hurting my community. So I really want to invite y'all. Um, they have this really great book. I wish I had it to grab, but um, it's beyond the gender binary. And I want to invite folks to think about, you know, your relationship to your gender and that also our femininity and masculinity. Um, because um, it's not just for one person. It's not just for one, one body of people. Um, that's it. Check. Oh, and then I just want to do a shameless plug because I intentionally wore these earrings because this one is from a Tongba artist. Um, if you don't know them, uh, their name is Kelly Caballero. Um, they're a local uh, Tongba uh, leader, archivist, a bunch of things, and we featured them on our events. And so I intentionally wore this since I'm like, I should wear, um, you know, pieces from, from local artists, especially since um, she's also a really good friend. So really glad to share space with her. So I just wanted to do a highlight. I'll put that in both. Um, I think I would like to thank, um, I think I'd like to thank all my homegirls. Um, and that is, uh, you know, everyone at East Yard um, that has, you know, I think supported me um, through all of this has really pushed me to do, um, to do public comment like Laura um, <laughs> um, and like Janet to do like Cosecha Colectiva, you know, to learn more about that. Um, and so, yeah, everyone, you know, all the homegirls at East Yard, shout out to them just because, you know, they really helped me through all of this. And my homegirls at school, so like my friend um, Nicole, Tatiana, who's on this right now, <laughs> they're watching me supporting, yay, thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, 
shout out to them because they really, you know, they've been, they've kind of been there for me. So initially I came into Oxy as a kinesiology major and that was great and all, but then the science wasn't really my thing. And so then I switched to UEP and like, I think that transition like was, that transition was great. I think, you know, I've learned so much and like the conversations I have with them, like they've really been supportive and we're like, yeah, like, you know, like F capitalism and like they're doing all this and like, you know, they let me talk about the environment and I kind of ramble on sometimes, but you know, they're, they're listening to me. And so they've really been like, you know, um, not like blood family, but like family nonetheless. So yeah, so shout out to all my homegirls out there. I love y'all, <laughs> but yeah. I will have to echo what Frenchie said. Um, definitely all the homegirls at East Yard, honestly, because before that, on, I didn't really have um, a woman to look up to besides my mom, obviously, rushing to my mom. But like that actually like helped me and like find my voice and actually believed in me when I didn't even have belief in myself. And when I found East Yard, I was actually in one of my lowest points of my life. Um, did not. I was ashamed of like my major and like why I picked it and not even like that like school was very stressful for me at the time and you know going to like um, summer school during that time and then also like it was just a lot that I was going through mentally um, and just like thinking to myself that I didn't even believe in myself and then um, all of a sudden amazing people like Laura, Cindy, <laughs> Janet and then like so like all the women at East Yard are amazing and just helping me find that voice and just encouraging me to still push myself to my limits and even beyond that. And just honestly, because without them, I probably wouldn't even be here in this panel talking to you guys. And especially without them, I wouldn't have figured out um, what I really wanted to do with my life um, career wise, you know, and definitely they've they shown me so much support that I like never, never really felt before. So yeah. So shout out to all the homegirls at East Yard. Okay, so um, this topic is very sentimental to me. So um, <laughs> I tried taking deep breaths, but I don't think it's gonna work. Um, but wait, I need to connect myself. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, wait. <laughs> okay, so my mom. Wait, I can't. <laughs> wait. <laughs> wait, wait. I don't know. <laughs> Wait. Okay. Um, so wait, let me drink water and hopefully that will help. Okay, um so I wanna <laughs> Okay, I can't. <laughs> Wait. It's all good, Marily. Take your deep breaths, drink your water. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Wait. Okay, so wait, <laughs> I'm not ready. Um wait just one second. I had it all in my head, but it's hard to pick it out. So um <laughs> okay. Um <laughs> okay, I want to give credit to my mom. <laughs> Take deep breaths. And if you feel more comfortable sharing it on the chat, if you want to type it. That's also an option if it's too hard to like say it out loud, right? Because I think you're 
you're having such beautiful, strong emotions to, to name this person, this human being, right? That's an inspiration to you. And that's really, really powerful. And that says that's already speaks mountains for the appreciation that you have for your mom. Um, and also, I cry all the time. We a lot, I've seen almost everybody here cry all the time. So if you need to let it out, like that's okay too. Uh, like Tiff said on the, the chat, Chiona's United, yes. Um, <laughs> Sad Girls Club rooting is for you, Marili, yeah. Um, you let me know what, what you wanna do. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try again. If not, then I'll just try and chat. Okay, so um, I guess um, when um, no, I think I'm fine. <laughs> okay, but well, thank you. Um, so when I think of my mom, how I <laughs> idolized idolize her. Um, I think about this time that. We went to the. Um, we went to like a doctor's appointment because I think something was wrong with my leg. I don't remember, but the um the doctor had asked me. Um, wait. Um, he had asked me. Um, what do I want to be when I grow up? And. Usually it's like, oh, I want to be like, I want to be a lawyer or I want to be a doctor. But the first thing that came in mind was, I guess my mom's job. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I guess now I don't, I, I guess, then I didn't realize that that wait that I didn't realize that I wanted that I wanted to be her because I realized how you know how empowering and strong she was. So I was like, I was like, oh, I want to work in an office with a cubicle and, you know, do work because that's what, that's what she did. And, and I guess still now she is the core of the reason why. You know, I am able to speak, to speak out and be my own person and, you know, care for others and to not be scared to take chances because I can't imagine how many sacrifices she did for, you know, to raise me and my brothers, so... Yeah, I wish that you guys were able to understand. <laughs> but yeah, I give credit to my mom. Thank you, Marily, for pulling through and being able to share. Really appreciate it. And yes, uh, all the love to your mom. All the a shout out to all the mamas in the chat, uh, all the mamas that we appreciate, whether they be blood moms or not blood moms, right? There's also mother figures in our lives that take on that role of supporting us and nurturing us and providing us that inspiration, right? That you see Marily in your mom. Um, I want to thank all, all, all four of you for being sort of saying yes to being part of this panel. Um, I learned more about each and every single one of you every time we engage, right, and build community and share. Um, I want to thank all the folks that are still here pulling through uh, in the attendees section. Um, and I also want to give a thank you to uh, Oxy Arts, Karina Caicedo, uh, Maricela, you're here, right, in the background with all the logistical support. Stephanie, huge shout out to you and thank you. Um, to, to continue 
continue learning more, getting informed around what eCert is doing, I invite you all to follow us on social media. Uh, our handle is at EYCEJ. Uh, thank you, Jan. And we also have our website, uh, eycej.org. There's a donate button on that website if you have the coins and can help continue funding this movement. Uh, we hugely appreciate it um, because we are trying to keep this moving, keep changing the game for our hoods. Um, and so again, thank you. Thank you to everyone that's here on the panel. I, I see you. I love you all. Um, and thank you everyone who came and showed up to, to listen in and hear and learn more about ECRD. Um, that this concludes our, our panel. Um, have a good rest of your evening and uh, see y'all on the front lines. <laughs>